So we're actually going to configure an IP fire um, uh, router slash server today. Um, I actually do have a, uh, a brew squee. You can't really have do any work without having a brew, can you? Um, so uh, specs on the machine then, like my untangle video pretty much. Chuck it on anything, Raspberry Pi, even ARM chips. It runs on ARM chips for F's sake. That's where Untangle needs to go. ARM chips is what you need. Um, so you can run it on a on a Raspberry Pi if you really want to. Um, I wouldn't recommend it though because it'll just be generally rubbish. Because the I mean, ARM's good, but it's just not got enough power behind it. Um, I'm actually going to be running on an Octoplex, that Dell Octoplex I was talking about the other day with Pentium 4 and 2 gigs of RAM. And the only thing you need to worry about, of course, is having at least two NICs, three NICs if you're going to have like an extra one for public access Wi-Fi on top of, because you can have like blue connections, which I'll go into before before all that stuff. I will go into that. Um, and that's pretty much it. So what we'll do is we'll go and grab the install files, and then we'll go from there. Right, so the first thing we want to do is actually grab the uh, install files for IPFire just by going to ipfire.org. And we're going to download, you can, you know, there's several download options, we'll go into that. Um, the default is obviously the ISO, which you can burn on ISO if you want to, but we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to go i586. Um, you can run ARM, of, you know, you can run it on, um, uh, on Raspberry Pi boards and stuff like that. We're just going to go and grab the uh, USB FDD image. If you find that doesn't work, you can use the HDD image as well, but I just generally use the, the FDD. You can even put this on embedded devices, and you can you can do all sorts of really cool stuff with it. But say, we're just going to grab the FDD, and then what we're going to do is, we're going to, we'll, what you need to do is basically use Win32 Disk Imager to you uh, to put that onto a, um, onto a USB pen drive. Obviously, you will have to unzip it, but I'm not going to go into Win32 Disk Imager because it's just a waste of time, really, pretty much. Uh, so once you've got the install files, we'll actually go over and uh, and install IPFire. So obviously, once we've got our install files and we've created some install media, we're going to select our install media. Uh, for obvious reasons, we're going to use a USB device because um, well, it's because that's the install media we created. Obviously, you can use CD. And then it'll ask us what we want to do. Um, we're just going to go and install IP file. We're not going to do anything to do with mem test or anything like that, which is quite cool. They've, been, they've had that there, so you can actually do a mem test before you get any further, which is quite cool. So then once it's loaded the install, all we need to do is select our language, which is obviously going to be English. Uh, yes, that's fine. Going to accept the license, press in the space bar, scrolling across OK. It's also going to be in, um, reformat our hard drive as well, so make sure you've got any work off there you need. Um, we're just going to press yes. Use the standard EXT4, we don't need to worry about that unless you really know what you're doing with uh, file file systems. I would just leave it standard. Then what it's going to do is it's going to uh, actually install Untangle, uh, Untangle IP Fire and um, put all the, uh, yeah, but basically put all things like Grub on there and all the Linux installs and stuff. So once it's actually installed it, it'll ask you to reboot, so we'll just give a reboot on that one. Right, so now it's going to actually boot us into um, IPFAR itself. Now by default, because it's a German company and it's a German project, it's already automatically selected a German keyboard. We don't want that because we're in the UK, we want to select a UK keyboard. It doesn't just come up as like QWERTY, you have to go all the way down to UK and just select that one, it's very weird I know. We are going to be, well we're actually not in London, but we may as well use London time because that's what we are, that's fine. Keep, I mean, unless you really want to change the host name, I'm just going to keep the same for a minute, and the domain name I'm going to keep the same as well, unless you've got your own funky thing going. Uh, root password, I'm just going to give it a BS one for a minute. Uh, root doesn't necessarily matter too much unless you use a CLI. I'm just going to give this a BS password as well for a minute, because it doesn't matter. Um, I will reconfigure this again. Right, now this is where we actually get to um, setting up our NICs. Now, this is where you sort of have to be a bit careful. So, there's there's... There's essentially loads of different one, um, configurations you can use. The red one is 
well, obviously the nasty, horrible one that's coming in, it's not firewalled. Green is then obviously our nice green connection, you know, that's all firewalled and that's fine and dandy. Our orange connection is the DMZ. So if you want to have a DMZ, you set up that as an orange connection. And then blue is for your wireless LAN. So if you want to have that separate separate on your network, um, you can have that there as well, which is quite good. For the moment, we're just going to use green and red because we don't really need to worry about anything else. Drivers and card assignments. And this is where, unlike... Um, Unlike Untangle, where you've got a nice GUI that tells you whether or not things are plugged in or not, this doesn't. So what you need to do is you need to make sure you know what your um, what your NICs are before you get going. Now I know for a fact that the Broadcom is the onboard ship, and that's the one we're using for our WAN. So I'm going to select that one. And I know for a fact the green one is the first one on the list, ending in 9C. So we're going to select that one there as well. So once that's done, we're going to scroll over and select Done. Uh, address settings now this is where we need to look at address settings as well now for red we need that to be a DHCP because it's going to get it from our existing um, router although it could be getting it from a modem or anything like that as well and then the green connection it will tell us it will warn us saying oh you don't want to do this because just in case you got it running but because we're setting it up it doesn't matter so in there what we're going to do is we're going to just give it a BS one for a minute 192.168.0.1 yes I know that's a crappy home one but we're not going to worry about this it isn't going into a business environment outside user 10 address and then that's fine so then once we we'll go over to done not okay annoyingly they need to change that it doesn't it, yeah, you press OK and it just goes into it. We don't want to go into it. We just want to go uh, go over to Done. DNS and Gateway. Unless you really want to use your own DNS, I uh, wouldn't worry about it for a minute. We're, because you've got DHCP running, we don't need to worry about default gateway either, so that's fine. And then we need to go over to Done. And then it will ask us to sort out our DHCP server for the server. So I'm going to start it at 1... 192.168.0.1 whoops dot 100 and end it in 192.168.0.200 that's just standard IT practice obviously if you if you work it depends on how the size of your network and what subnets you've got going on but that's fine we're going to leave primary DNS is going to be, so our router is going to be the DNS server Least time is a little bit short, but I'm just going to leave it as that. We don't need to worry about that for a minute. I'm going to go OK on that one and the setup is complete so we'll go OK on that one and then what it's going to do is it's going to boot our server and just say to us, everything's fine and dandy. But what I like to do is I actually like to give this a restart because I don't trust it enough. Uh, once I've configured everything, I like to give it a restart so it can settle down a bit. Right, so once it's actually started up our router, you'll actually find that this is just a CLI. So there's not really much we can do to it. The only thing we can, we can log in this route, obviously. Um, and that's all it will give us. It won't give us a GUI. So to get, to get into the web interface, what you need to do is you need to access a computer that's connected to the server. And we'll go ahead and we'll do that in a minute. I'm just going to give this a reboot. All you need to do is log in as root and just go in reboot. I've tried to actually get it to um, to try and shut this down and I can't figure out the syntax for it. So I need to actually have a look at that because it's not letting me shut it down for some weird reason. You have to put a tack on everything and it's just like, ugh, it's just annoying. So once that restarts, then obviously you can then log in and we'll, we'll basically we'll go into the web interface and show you what that's like. So once we've actually got our server up and running and installed, what we need to do is then access the web interface. Now, um, what you need to do is you basically need to whatever IP address you've given it, you need to find that out and you also need to point it to port 444 and obviously make sure it's HTTPS. Um, this is from the um, the IP fire uh, wiki so I will put a link in the description below but you can see it up there um, and then what we're going to do is just go to here. It's then going to ask us for our the, the username and pass we gave it so obviously my BS one for a minute if I can actually type and password there we go Right, so then what it'll do is it'll give us our, it will give us the interface, and on the first page it'll actually give us the most basic of basic stuff. It'll tell us what our DNS servers are. It'll tell us what our gateway is, and it'll also tell us uh, the IP address that it's been connected through the internet with, which is quite cool. And we can do, we can just change all sorts of uh, weird, wonderful things in here without having to go into the CLI, which is quite cool. Um, we've got a few, um, a few connections there added to uh, to the network, and. And this is kind of it, really. I'm not going to go too much into what you can, well, in terms of configuring stuff, because I don't know much myself. Um, I've only been running for a, for a week, and uh, and yeah, it's sort of, and well, I don't know, for about six months. Um, one thing I will recommend you do, please enable the Fire Info service. Basically, what this does is it allows, it supports the community, basically. 
Uh, basically, you send your profile to IPFire. They know you've downloaded it, installed it, and are running it. And uh, and obviously, they can just monitor things, and just make sure things are going well. If there's, is there any crashes or anything like that, they can look into it. Although I have to say, this thing I've is never crashed on me, so uh, that's that. Um, the only other thing is the the advanced web proxy. This is one of the cool things I quite like. It does cache management. So what you can do is you can cache um, web pages, and if if like your WAN goes down, for instance, people can still access some stuff that's offline, um, which is quite good. And also we've got stuff like an update accelerator. So if someone, if people have got um, down, uh, people if people are downloading updates for Windows, for instance. All you need to do is, if one person downloads an update for Windows or Adobe, uh, Adobe Acrobat or anything like that, it'll find that and it'll cache it in your um, on your drive. And then obviously anybody else that uses it saves bandwidth and actually accesses it from the router as opposed to going to the World Wide Web, which is quite cool. We've got things like connection schedule. There's all sorts of stuff you can do, but again, it's not it's not easy to get. You know, to to figure out that's things like the the proxy, for instance. I tried to have a go at this and I just couldn't figure it out. Um, it's lots of um, it's just a mass wall of text. I think they do need to get the um, get the interface sorted, but it's not as clean as Untangle. It still does a job quite well, though. Uh, but apart from that, I think that's that's pretty much it. I will try and do some more Untangle stuff, uh, Untangle IP fire stuff, and uh, and apart from that, I shall catch you in a later video.